Hello, everyone. And a warm welcome to this evening's event. My name is Priscilla Baez, and I work at the Earth Commons. Uh, the Earth Commons, we're an institute at Georgetown University that promotes education, research, and action around the world's most pressing environment and sustainability issues. At the Earth Commons, I coordinate events and communications. I deeply believe in the power of gatherings, just like these ones, that is inspire minds and foster a deeper connection with our environment. Tonight, we're here for an important talk hosted by the Center on Faith and Justice and the Earth Commons, where we will be diving into, inter into the intersection of ecology and democracy. In this election year, as the fabric of democracy strains, so does the delicate web of life supporting human existence. We will uncover the spiritual roots of this crisis and imagine just responses. I would like to take a moment to introduce our moderator, Kathleen, who has played a vital role in bringing this event to life. Dr. Kathleen Burnett not only serves as the assistant to the director and events coordinator at the Center on Faith and Justice, but also teaches courses on theology and justice here at Georgetown. Her commitment to this cause is evident in her work, including her book, Revolutionary Hope, as a spirituality of encounter and engagement in an evolving world. Additionally, I am very honored to introduce our esteemed panelists, whose expertise and dedication to environmental justice are truly inspiring. Sister Carol Sin currently serves as the Executive Director of the Leadership Conference of Women Religious. She has worked on the United Religions Initiative and the Earth Charter. Brenda Lee Richardson has been working on welfare reform, environmental justice, economic development, education, behavioral health, and health issues for the past 30 years. She currently serves as the coordinator of the Anacostia Parks and Community Collaborative in DC. Dr. Randa Lamster is the author of Peace Ecology and the co-director of Environmental Studies and the new major in Environment and Sustainability here at Georgetown and a faculty member in the Earth Commons. Jose Aguto most recently served as the executive director of the Catholic Climate Covenant. Before joining the Covenant, Jose worked for the Friends Committee on National Legislation, the National Congress of American Indians, and EPA's American Indian Environmental Office. Following our conversation, we'll, we invite you to join us at the reception to learn about practical next steps. But before we dive into our discussion, I am thrilled to announce the winner of our poetry contest. This contest asked our community to submit poems reflecting on themes of ecology, justice, and democracy. It is my honor to introduce Shelby Gresh, our winner. Shelby, originally from Idaho and a graduate of Georgetown School of Foreign Service, now works as a postback fellow at the Earth Commons, where she manages the Hoya Harvest Garden, which may look like a garden, but it's much more. The Living Laboratory generates fresh produce for Georgetown's food pantry and offers hands-on learning experience for students. Shelby, we're very proud to have you as a part of our community, and I'm very lucky to have you as my coworker and learn from you on a daily basis. Please join us in sharing your poem. Does that work? This is called Building This Thing. Imagining this thing was easy because I grew up turning fields of wheat stubble into piles of produce with my dad and better worlds with my friends. Plus, I did the reading and I had the best intentions and surely all good things get done quickly. Building this thing was hard. As it turns out, the Eden in my head was made of mundane things like zoning and budgets and tax exemptions and backflow preventers and nutrient levels and endless emails, and really we had it easy. I mean that it was learning, developing calluses and reading and listening and listening again and then listening anyways. Learning to synthesize and compromise, not unlike a plant, in a time when we are still divided on whether it's competition or cooperation that builds the world. Or maybe it's just math, 1600, 
1,695 row feet, 50,000 pounds of compost, the number of servings in a butternut squash, and how many squashes pay a mortgage. But then how many mortgages in a nation, and at what cost when the squash has lost her sisters, and how do you apologize with a garden? Building this thing was work. I mean that my body hurt all spring, and my heart ached the rest of the time, and you know what they say about many hands, yet still it took too long. It took too long because the soil is dying, and the insects are dying, and people are dying, and this is not enough. But it has nothing to do with scarcity. Building this thing was hope. I mean that the bumblebees sang to me while I weeded, and people helped for nothing in return. We gifted flowers without anticipating the vases to return and multiply. I guess I mean that hope is hard, work for the soul, and that hard work is hope ongoing. Thank you very much, Shelby, for helping us gather into this space and um, engage in this collective uh, effort to, to learn more about these intersections of, of our world. Um, I'm really excited and grateful to all of you for, for being part of this conversation. Uh, for those of you who might not know much about the Center on Faith and Justice, where uh, I work, as Priscilla mentioned in her lovely introduction, um, we were founded in 2021 by the Reverend Jim Wallace. Uh, our mission centers around four key focus areas, uh, uprooting systemic racism, alleviating poverty, building a multiracial democracy, and um, and building peace in the US and the world. And so this conversation tonight, I'm excited to engage in, to, to look at how all of those things are really um, connected to environmental justice. And so, um, you know, as Pope Francis wrote in his encyclical Laudato Si, we know just how inseparable the bond is between concern for nature, justice for the poor, commitment to society, and interior peace. And so as we, uh, move through this conversation tonight. I hope we touch on all of those connections more deeply and especially uh, focus on some of the, the spiritual and values, uh, value-driven responses that can help us uh, engage with and respond to um, all of these, these issues. Um, so I want to start uh, just by asking each of you uh, to, to help us understand what drew you into this cause, what, what motivates you um, from a, a value standpoint. And Brenda, we can start with you. I think what drew me and motivated me was I live in what we call a disfavored community. Um, we're not marginalized, we're not vulnerable, we're disfavored. And I realized that we were so busy trying to keep a roof over our heads, feed our kids, and actually dodging bullets in my neighborhood that we were not paying attention to our environment. And so I realized that it was important for me to be at the table to give voice to the disfavored community. Thank you. Sister Carol. I would say I think what drew me into this um, conversation, you know, about the work necessarily, about the conversation, is that twofold in relationship to what you just said, Brenda. Uh, one of the big impetus is for me about 10, 15 years ago was realizing that I do not live in a disfavored community, that I walk around this world in white skin, and that absolutely everything um, is impacted by that. So it raised my awareness around the environmental um, challenges. But I would also say that, um, and I hope I don't throw a monkey wrench into anything here, but for me, what really drew me in, the second thing was that when I learned that environment and ecology are not the same, and, and so I became very intrigued when I learned in a class that uh, it's the work of ecology that really does matter. So I hope we were able to share in some of that tonight, that conversation. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Jose. Uh, when, when I was in law school, I asked myself the question, who are the people most abused by the rule of law or the lack of application of the rule of law? And one of my answers was Native Americans. So I've been blessed to work for 12 years with Native American elders and tribes um, and seeing how their ways of life, their cultures, their ceremonies, their food, their ecosystems 
are all interrelated. There is nothing there that is separate, like we often do in Western society. And that interconnectedness is something that drives me to do this work today. Thank you. Randall. Thanks. Um, and thank you, Kathleen, for putting this together. Um, I would say I'm drawn by a sense of crisis and have been for a very long time, but animated and inspired by a sense of possibility. And I came to realize over the course of my journey that the two things are never far apart, that places where injustice makes itself evident are also places where the voices and experiences that, that accrue there need to be listened to the most, that we can learn so much from those moments. And it turns out that wherever we're located on the, the spectrum of all of our different demographics and ideologies and ways of looking at the world, we're all implicated in those places. There is no there there. There is no divisibility of our experience together. So once we start leaning into that sense of shared challenge, we can find our common purpose and our common humanity, which then leveraged together gives us a chance to address our profound environmental issues as well. Thank you. And I want to actually follow up with, with you about that. Um, I think this conversation, uh, ecology and democracy aren't always linked in conversations. And so uh, we are linking them tonight. And so I, I hope that, um, or I want to ask you if you can kind of give us a general overview of how you see those things as connected. Um, yeah, I'd like to think that it's self-evident, but it's not, as you said. Um, and it took me a while to get there myself. I mean, for a long time, the focus was mostly on social justice issues and conflict and, and nonviolence and, and transformation at that scale. But it becomes quickly apparent that we don't exist in a vacuum, right? Like our human, human social interactions, our political decisions are deeply interconnected with the way that we access and distribute resources in the world the ways that um, some communities are benefiting enormously from systems of production, distribution, and consumption, and other communities are decidedly impacted by those. And to the extent that we bifurcate the world into those places politically or economically, it defies the logic of how ecosystems actually work, which as Jose said, is, is about interconnectedness, right? That we can learn a lot from the way ecological systems operate in our human societies. Now, we can't map those exactly, right? We have to be a little careful there that we're not necessarily behaving as an ecosystem proper. But we can take a lot of lessons from environmental systems about the balance of interdependent parts and the premium on diversity being a strength of those systems and trying a, a lot of different ways of human experiments and living to find our best practices and to be working together towards something that sustains the whole, as opposed to the, uh, the, the idea we often manifest in our world, which is somehow my self-interest is supposed to be antithetical to the, to the good of the order. And that's illogical, and I would submit self-defeating, and it is fundamentally contradictory to the way that environmental systems actually operate. Uh, wow, thank you. Um, Brenda, I want to come to you uh, in relation to that. Oh, I can't wait to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just can you tell us how that thought, these connections, play out in your experience on the ground in your community? Well, so I'm, I'm just fascinated by what all of you have shared because I think that we don't look at systems when it comes to ecology and democracy. We look at trauma. The, the, I always feel like we've got to dig deeper to understand the trauma. And that's what causes us to be blindsided. That's what causes environmental racism and injustice because folks don't understand. So I worked with a student at, it wasn't Georgetown, you guys, it was GW, is that okay? <laughs> and she gave me this definition of trauma she said, it's the embodiment of the rejection of blackness. The embodiment of the rejection of blackness. So what does that mean? As I'm sitting here, and this is back to what you said earlier, as I'm sitting here because I'm traumatized, and I am traumatized, um, 
I hear what you just said with wounded ears. So what everybody else heard, they heard directly what you said, but I heard it with my wounded ears. And when I look at things, I see it with my wounded eyes. And if folks don't have an appreciation of that, we will continue to be exactly where we are at the bottom and we'll never get anywhere beyond that. And I think the other thing that happens with trauma is that somehow it translates into fear for people outside of our neighborhoods because they're afraid to come in and help us. Um, so when I'm exhausted, Kathleen, I have to depend on you to come and help advocate for me. We've learned that, um, can I talk about heat sensitivity? Mm -hmm. We've learned that heat sensitivity, for example, as it relates to climate change, has a direct correlation to violence. So violence is escalating east of the river. But what are we doing? We're depending on the police department to take care of it instead of planting more trees. Does that make sense? Thank you so much. Um, I want to ask you a follow-up. Um, as you're talking, I know that you've talked a little bit about um, how your communities, sometimes it can be um, difficult to, to motivate uh, sort of environmental concern when there are more immediate concerns. And so I, I'm curious if, uh, what the connection is for between those things, the immediate concerns, or how you make that case that, that ecological concern is also an immediate concern. And so I'll use trees as an mm -hmm. example. So um, we realize that if you look at DC and you look at its tree canopy, you'll find that the Anacostia River divides my community from your community. And when you look at, uh, I saw it from um, a sky perspective, you can clearly see that the tree canopy east of the river is not as robust as it is on this side of the river. So we've made a concerted effort to plant more trees, but you guys, there are lots of black folks that feel very uncomfortable with trees because it's a public safety issue. And you get it, right? Mm -hmm. Because it, blind, it, it blinds your view mm -hmm of what's in front of you or what's on the side of you. So when we get ready to work with urban forestry, with the DC government or Casey Trees to plant trees, the community is like, oh no, 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 we can't do that. And even though they, the benefits are, will be cooler, we'll have cleaner air, they're like, no, we don't want trees in our community. The other thing is, when I come to Georgetown and I look at the um, tree line, you guys have 10 trees for every block and I've got four. There's something wrong with that. Talk about democracy. There's something wrong with that. But who's paying attention? Nobody is paying attention. So when I get back to the trees, what we had to do in order to build our tree canopy is we started planting memory forests. So for folks who have lost a loved one to gun violence, we will plant a tree in a park. We will plant a tree in their neighborhood as long as we get permission. But what it does is it, we have to come up with a creative way to get our community connected to trees and the memory forest was the only way that we were able to do that. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I think what you said about who's paying attention to that is really important. And Jose, I want to come to you next because I know uh, a lot of the work that you do is about trying to get people to pay attention um, and, and bringing together these issues from a policy perspective. So um, I'm wondering, you know, I know you've, you've said that uh, democracy uh, is essential for pursuing these kinds of, of efforts uh, to, to sustain the, our common home. And so um, can you speak to that a little bit, those connections that you see and how you've gone about trying to get people to pay attention and some of the challenges there and successes. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, well, one of the efforts that we're trying to engage in is, is reach out to conservatives who care about climate change. Uh, this is a, a much more nuanced and quiet conversation because, as you may know, um, if, if, for example, some Republicans come out strongly with regard to climate change, then, then they threaten their political um, future. Um, 
so we're trying to have these conversations. We know that there are conservatives who care about climate. I've been working on this issue for 17 years, and when I was on the Hill, uh, many of them said privately that they care deeply about this. Um, so how can we provide them with the spiritual sustenance, particularly focus, focusing, for example, on Catholic Republicans? How can we have them consider their decision-making processes from the foundation of their Catholic faith, which would mean care for the common good, and being able to lift that up uh, as something important, um, not just for their political career, but frankly for their soul, as well as for their children and the legacy, recognizing that we've got a climate crisis that demands moral courage. Thank you. Um, Sister Carol, I want to come to you. Um, Jose referenced how Catholic faith can animate some of these efforts. And um, communities of women religious have been at the forefront of a lot of uh, efforts to, to make their community sustainable. And um, you know everything from land conservancies to land back efforts. Um, you know, I'll let you speak to that. But um, you've also, at LCWR, been hosting the Transformative Justice Initiative, where you, um, which is grounded in contemplation and um, focused on learning skills and practices to both develop an ecological sensibility and um, engage in political participation and, and right relationships generally. And so um, can you tell us about the links between the sustainability efforts that you uh, and, and other women religious have undertaken and this more contemplative uh, spiritual side of things? Sure, thank you. Um, if you don't mind, I, I, you know, I asked you if you deliberately set this up on the day of the uh, eclipse and you said no, you didn't. <laughs> When I was looking at the scriptures for today, I thought, oh, this day must have been set up, you know, for, for um, you know, the, the, day, the next day, rather. Because tomorrow morning's reading begins with, the community of believers are of one heart and mind, and no one claimed that any of their possessions were their own. They held everything in common. Mm -hmm. I think at the heart of both ecology, environment, <clears throat> democracy, is this, the answer to the question, who's paying attention? is about relationships. Mm. And so what apostolic religious life has done from its beginnings in the 16th, 17th century in Europe and then coming here, if anybody has seen the movie Cabrini, um, I encourage you to see it. An Italian sister that came to New York and Chicago for the Italian immigrants. And exactly what you were describing was their experience. They lived in the sewers. They, nobody was paying attention. So part of the call of gospel, not just religious life. Part of the call, I think, of all faith traditions, you find in, in all the sacred texts, this sense of, I am my brother and sister's keeper. I think that the spiritual piece is to realize that at the heart of whether it's democracy or environment or ecology is relationships. And, and, and so, what we've come to in our discernment at LCWR is that while direct services, like planting trees and you know, seeing what the sharks are telling us and paying attention to the policymakers on Capitol Hill, that actual one-on-one -on -one direct service that's necessary, systemic change obviously is necessary, political advocacy obviously is necessary. I hate to put a pin in anybody's balloon, but they are not working. They are not working and so, what we have been led to in our own prayer and reflection is there needs to be a transformation of consciousness. You know, the biggest change that needs to happen, at least to people like me, who live where we live, is between our ears and then to get from there to our heart. Now, I know that sounds soft, but I'll tell you this, contemplative work is really hard to actually deeply listen to your story. Really putting aside my, well, if you just did this or just did that. Deeply listening, deeply listening to what the sharks are trying to tell us about what we are doing as the ones with choice on the planet to impact their habitat. Deeply listening to these Catholic conservatives who in their heart want clean water for their children. And I think they really do care that everybody else on the other side of the planet has clean water. It's really hard work 
to create the kind of space that can have those conversations because we, we want to start at the environmental racism level or the immigration issue at the southern border or what's going on or not going on on Capitol Hill. We want to start at the tip of the iceberg and what we have discerned, along with a lot of other people, is that the work that needs to be done now is under the iceberg. We have got to learn that we are, in fact, our brothers and sisters keeper. I know that sounds fluffy, maybe, but I'm telling you, I've been 55 years living this vocational life, and I'm still learning. I'm still learning how to really listen, because the way I listen is through white, Irish, German, Catholic um, ears and mindsets. I have a very good friend of mine who's a Lakota Sioux. Uh, Lakota Sioux. I saw the movie back in the 90s, Dances with Wolves, mm. with him. It was, at the, it was about the Lakota Sioux indigenous tribe. And I, I don't think I have ever seen that movie in the same way because I watched it the first time with him. To hear him cry when the buffaloes were hunted beyond the one buffalo that the warriors agreed they would fell in order to handle the two or three families in the, in the camp. I said, why are they doing that? He said, well, I, they just stopped shooting their arrows. I said, did somebody give a signal? Did I miss something? He said, no. They take what they need, and they promise the four-legged people that they will take care of them for the next year, because the four-legged people sacrifice some of themselves to take care of the two-legged people. That is, that's ecology. That's understanding the relationships in the entire household. That's the household that's over next to you, my little globe that I brought with me. That's the household that Pope Francis is talking about. It's our common home. Maybe there's someplace else to live, I don't know. But that's it for now. And, and to understand what are all of those relationships. And I'll just end with the work, it seems to us, is every relationship that you can think of, from Capitol Hill to people of color sitting next to people of no color. After all, not white. There is no such thing as white. You know, if you saw somebody coming at you this color, white, you'd go running in the opposite direction. But people of no color and people, that the relationships are all polarized. It's us and them, humans and the animals, people of color, people of no color, those who have, those who have not. All that kind of bifurcation is, is polarization. And so what we're trying to do is be faithful to that scripture reading, that the community of faith, the community of democracies, the community of humans on the planet, you fill in the blank, were of one mind and one heart. Everyone had what they needed. That is a huge, it's like pushing water up a hill with a teaspoon. <laughs> it's a very, very big challenge. It's not easy work. Mm, thank you. Um, yeah, the transformation of consciousness is, is the most important um, and, and hardest part of, of enacting change, I think. Um, thank you for raising that. And I want to follow up with that with, with each of you. Um, in, so, Randall, I'll start with you. As we think about the kinds of people that we want to be and the kinds of practices that we want to cultivate and um, the skills that we want to cultivate to enable uh, right relationships, especially when we're talking about uh, politically and sort of given the, the disharmony that is ongoing now, are there, how do you, what sources of wisdom do you gather from your work as an environmentalist? Well, um, being a more recent environmentalist in some ways, because I do come to this work through another lens. But that's interesting, because I'm with a lot of folks who are very steeped in that space for a long time. And their entry point is more about, like, planting trees, right? Which there's nothing inherently bad about that, except that context matters. And to me, it's a matter of zooming in and zooming out. We're capable of doing both. Like, Let's look at that orb. Like today we had an experience where we were all, for a brief moment, remembering that we're on a beautiful rock hurtling through space in this magnific magnificent display of the cosmos revealing little parts of itself, just to remember that shared moment of occupying this world. But we also have to zoom in, because it's not just about the carbon in the atmosphere, it's about the justice on the ground. And we need both at the same time or we get neither, right? We can't have a sustainable world at the environmental scale at the sacrifice of 
impacted communities. It doesn't work that way. Like inequality is just as much a threat to sustainability as climate change or environmental degradation. And it turns out that those two things are linked. And many of the great teachers have told us that throughout history for a very long time. Our differences do matter and, and they're relevant and important because none of us meets this world through the same set of eyes, right? We, we have different perspectives and different positionalities. That's good. But let's also remember the commonalities, that we do share this world and we share an ecosystem of ecosystems. We are an ecosystem unto ourselves. There's life within us that we carry forth. And paying attention to those things has always been part of the process. I mean, you go back to someone like Dr. King, right, who always articulated this perspective of maximal indivisibility. In fact, famous quote, right, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Justice is indivisible. We can't separate the world into the haves and the have-nots or the us's and the them's. He winds up concluding that all life is interrelated. And King, even though, you know, speaking in an era before environmentalism had reached its sort of modern vernacular, was expressing ecological concepts, that we are embedded in a, in a web of relationships all the time. We ignore that at our peril. So to me, the wisdom really is re-embracing that fundamental truth, that way of existing in the world that has served humans well for a very long time, that we have kind of conveniently forgotten because of convenience, right? We don't have to account for the externalities of the choices we make by and large, except for the fact that we're only separated sometimes by a few miles or a few blocks or even less distance. So what happens in one place doesn't stay there. And the more that we pay attention to that and we draw on those experiences, the stronger we can become. May I respond? Yes, please. So. Thank you for sharing that. And one of the, you just made me think about commonalities. And you made me think about listening and relationships. And I was just thinking about the fact that I work in, in three middle schools where kids ha may not ever come to this side of the river. They have no reason to come to Georgetown or to come on the other side of the river because their world is in Ward 8. And so how can we recognize commonalities if we haven't seen people outside of our own neighborhoods? Um, and when you talk about relationships, sometimes it's challenging to have relationships because if we can't be in a room on a more regular basis, having a conversation about what we believe and what our fears are. I could come here 10 years from now, I'll be 76 then. Mm -hmm. um, I could come here 10 years from now and we'll be having the same conversation. And I don't want to see that happen because I think this conversation is incredibly significant and I don't want to poo-poo the, all the work that the district government is doing because I work a lot with the district government. So let me put that out there. Uh, the Racial Equity Office, the Department of Energy and the Environment. But it's, is it their responsibility to look at environmental justice? Is it their responsibility? What response, who's, I don't know, sometimes it's just overwhelming to just think about it. Because we all have choices, we all have intentions, and good intentions, and we have the will. Do we have the will to not be afraid to go east of the river? I know people who think that if they cross that bridge that they're gonna be shot. I know people who think, I'll never forget, I was at George Washington University many, many years ago when my son was, uh, uh, nine years old. We were on the elevator. He was, we had gone, come home. We were leaving the doctor's office. A woman, God, she was non-black. Uh, I won't use the word white ever again. <laughs> she got on the elevator and she grabbed her bag. Mm -hmm. And my son said, mom, why did she do that? So I had to explain to my son at nine years old that you're a black man and you have to get used to this. Why should I have to do that? Does that resonate with anybody? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think, for, may I? Please. Yeah, I think, um, Brenda Lee, as I listened to you, I, I think that the most stark polarization, the one that you can see in an instant, is the color. And so I really appreciate you keeping that in the conversation because I think it's the place where the relationships are most out of balance, human to human, and in this country, maybe even more personified than maybe in other places. I think for myself, one of the things that I've had to reckon with is this notion that I live in an echo chamber. Mm. You know, I make myself watch the spectrum of news. You know, I make myself go to whatever country I'm interested in to find the English translation of the newspaper that those journalists are writing, rather than depending on whatever flavor I might get from this country or from the church. You know, but it, but it's work. It's work to be able to, I love when you said you would not want to come back here in 10 years be having the same conversation. I think the, what, a little step that I could take so that that doesn't happen is to make sure that I just do, that I'm not afraid to go on the other side of the river, you know? But none of my life experience is, is, is relatable to yours. Absolutely none yeah. of it, zero. I taught also, I taught teachers, and for their practicum, my head teachers in a suburban college say, I do not want to do a practicum in an inner city school. I want to go to the suburbs. In the inner city school, the kids don't have pencils. In the suburban schools, the kids have computers and calculators. And I would raise that in, cl in class, and the response I would often get was, that's the way it is. I think until we get under that kind of veneer, I, I don't know that any kind of meaningful conversation that will then lead to action is really going to be able to help. I don't want to sound hopeless. I'm very hopeful. But I really appreciate what you're saying because the eyes through which you look at all the issues are very different eyes than, than mine. And I don't know if Carlo, if uh, Jose's eyes are, are, are different, that's certainly different than mine. You've got the male and the female piece going mm -hmm. on here. You've got the educated and the uneducated. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I go back to the to the point of the, the work it seems to me and to many of the Catholic sisters and lots of other people is we have got to really be in relationship with each other. It, it is as simple as that. Because if I don't start to be in relationship with you, whatever policy happens off of Capitol Hill or whatever environmental law gets passed, it's not gonna be for me. It'll be for you or somebody else you know, to do something. So, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for, for sharing those, those things with us. Um, it's a lot to, to think about and reflect on. And I think, um, Jose, I want to come to you next, um, see if you want to add anything in here from the, the policy perspective um, or your own. Um, you know, you've said that, that you've agreed that the climate crisis is also a moral crisis, right? It's fundamentally a moral crisis. And that transforming the way that we think about things and the way that we understand ourselves in relationship um, to one another, to our common home, to our faith if we, if we are religious, um, that all of those things have to be, um, we have to, to reevaluate them if we want to move forward, if we want to see changes and the kinds of relationships that we um, are hoping will develop. And so I'm wondering if you can speak to um, what, why it is a moral crisis. What kinds of things uh, are you hoping to, to will emerge from, from that? Uh, well, first to start with, uh, Laudato Si, paragraph four, um, where Pope Francis quotes uh, Pope Paul VI, who in 1971 said, no matter what kind of economic uh, innovation, technological innovation, um, financial innovation, um, that happens uh, will be for naught unless there is a moral and social grounding to that um, and that we need a radical change of heart in order to prevent the environmental crisis as he saw it back in 1971. Um, pope Francis says the same thing. All of the popes probably would say the same thing. Um, the USCCB talks about we need a change of heart both within ourselves and within our society. Um, fundamentally, you could go down to the greatest commandment, to love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. 
And if you love your neighbor as yourself, then racism is completely wrong because you are saying that someone else is less than you. So if you ground yourself in that fundamental understanding as the core and work really, really hard to manifest that, and that is not easy, and we are all sinners, and we were all fail, but if we are pointed in that moral direction as our lodestar, the greatest commandment, from there, the source of the solution arises. Um, and that starts, from my understanding of reading the saints, is humility. And St. Augustine said, humility is the foundation of all virtue. Any expression of virtue without humility is only the mere shadow thereof. And then from hum humility, you can come to what Jesus said specifically is love thy enemy. And so if you come to your adversary with a sense of love, then you can start to build bridges. And the word pontiff is, by the way, from Latin, which means bridge builder. So we can all be pontiffs. So if we step deeply into these fundamental values, which are not just Catholic, but are of many religions of humility and love and bridge building and seeing your enemy as yourself and seeing all people as equal, from that basis can you then work to bridge against difference and even against the partisanship that we see today. Because if we step first and foremost into our faith, faith transcends partisanship. And there are common values that we all have that we love you know, our brothers and sisters, we love our children, we love our families, we take these values with us into these conversations grounded in these fundamental truths. But can you love, can you love me and see my color? Can you do what you just said from a, a faith and justice perspective when you see my color first? Are you able to love first before you see color? Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Yes. Well, I, I would say, you know, humility for me is that I have a lot of faults and I have a lot of filters and I have a lot of natural prejudices. And then ask God for forgiveness when I stumble, but to know that every time I stumble and if I ask Jesus for help that I will get up and granted that grace, so to fall but to move forward in that moral compass towards a better understanding and a more authentic love so that I'm seeing you as you are. Thank you. I was just, when he was talking, I was trying to figure out, I want a scripture too. <laughs> and, but the scripture that came to me is that, is he who is without sin, mm -hmm. let him cast the first stone. Yeah. And, and sometimes when, when, as I'm looking at this from a church perspective, it looks like we're just sinners and we're lost and we're hopeless and, and we're just waiting. Oh, I know what I always say. We're like on life support and we're waiting to be saved. And is it fair for us to wait? We're still waiting. Is it fair for us to wait? Thank you. I think your that question gets to the heart of the urgency of this, right? That that it's it's not fair, <laughs> and yet we have to commit to doing this, the work, the deep work of transformation. Um, if, if I may say, I think also the other species are saying the same thing. Yeah. Hmm. Do we have to wait until the humans decide they're not the, that they're not the center of the planet? that in fact the humans need every other species and the other species don't need us. In fact, some, I'll refer to my friend over there, but the last time I did this scientific work, if every species on the planet, or if humans disappeared tomorrow, every species on the planet would benefit seven times. Mm -hmm. So to your point, Jose, about humility, how do we take our rightful place in this circle of life, you know, from the Lion King. I mean, we are, we are all interconnected. We're all breathing the same air, we're all drinking the same water. What I put down my sink ends up in the Nile River, you know? Someday it's gonna fall as frozen snowflakes on the third generation of Alaskans. I mean, until we get that transformation of mindset, because that I think is what at least my heart needs. I need to think differently about you, about the owls, about the trees, and so forth. Um, and we're not taught that. 
Yeah. We're, we're not taught that. Thank yet. you. So some of the, the values that I've heard emerging in this conversation are, um, you know, and, and the values that will help motivate and sustain right relationships with one another, with our earth. Um, some of these values are humility and generosity and um, care. I'm hearing um, invitation over domination and gratitude and creativity over consumption and, and taking. Um, but those are not words that I would use to describe our political engagement right now. Um, and so as a, a way of concluding the conversation before we get to audience q and I just want to ask each of you, um, what are some practices that you can suggest <laughs> to help us um, really ground ourselves in those values and, and develop a sense of interconnectedness? How do we, we develop sustainable ways of being ourselves so that we can um, foster right relationships uh, politically and ecologically? And uh, Randall, let's start with you. Great. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, how do we use our grounded practices to address this moment of profound political polarization and, oh, by the way, climate change and everything in between? Um, but maybe it's not that complicated. Like, as my colleagues reminded me before we came up here, breathe, yeah. right? Let's remember that we're embodied. We reflect the world around us. We don't just take it in. We also contribute back out. Um, Let's mix our hands in the earth again. Let's reconnect ourselves, literally and metaphorically, back to that wellspring of life. Let's remember this shared journey and the bounty that's made possible by forces well beyond any of our grasp or control. Um, and you can be secular or spiritual in that path to take to the magnificence of that integrated creation that we all benefit from. If you want to call them ecosystem services, that's OK with me too, right? But we're all in that, and we can operationalize that in our lives. We don't have to wait for the world to change to you know, step into a better future. We get the choice to, to, in some ways, do that moment by moment. We are confronted with a myriad of opportunities all throughout the course of our days to make a difference, whether it's listening more intently, approaching something with a beginner's mind and a sense of humility, reaching out across barriers of transportation and geography and demography and showing up, right? Stepping up and stepping back. We get to make those choices all the time. So while there is an aspirational sense to this work, absolutely. I mean, I think democracy itself is aspirational. It's calling upon us to try to reorient ourselves on, in a rough version of equality so that we can all have a chance to bring our best selves to the work. But we don't have to wait for all of that to happen. It's what we do along the way that starts to bend that arc of justice. And we get to be part of that. It's an exciting invitation. And I think, you know, for all the moments in our lives that present themselves as challenges, back to where I started my soliloquy here, um, that those are also invitations to participate in doing something different. In other words, each time through the cycle of crisis and response, we can plant the seeds of a better iteration the next time through rather than further exacerbating the problem. We can use the challenges um, politically, economically, socially, and environmentally to ask us to plant better seeds so that next time through we get a little better and we tamp down the drivers of those crises and conflicts and over time we start to accrue a different set of capacities for being uh, on this world. It's not that complicated when we break it down to, you know, to doing it. And that is usually the first step of faith is actually doing the work, that it can't just be a conversation. It has to continue into how we actually live our lives. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, are we Jose? going left or yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> You're next. <laughs> um, well, there are two uh, very different um, responses I have. Uh, first, uh, yes, please step outside and um, put your bare feet on the ground. Um, a few days ago, there was a rain, a soft, gentle rain, and I just opened my head up and just let the water hit my face and the water come into my mouth. And there's God's creation right there at that moment. Um, so that connectedness is there all of the time. Today's partial eclipse was amazing. I loved watching 
the sun and its intensity dim and seeing this kind of whitish light hit the ground and I'm like, is that the sun's beam sort of casting some of the moonbeams through to the ground and then feeling the, intense, the sun's intensity dim with the eclipse and then grow back? I mean, just be in that moment is getting reconnected um, with literally the rhythms of the earth. You're getting reconnected with the rhythms of that intensity of the sun as the moon is passing through it. The second, and we haven't talked about this, but I'm, you know, and it's been in the back of my mind, or it's been in the front of my mind all of this time. The economic systems in which we are in are destroying our earth. And there are corporations who are intentionally destroying our earth, um, and CEOs and boardrooms who are doing this intentionally. Um, and they have a lot of political support, support to continue to do this. And this has been going on for centuries to your point of, I don't want to have the same conversation in a decade. I do not want to have this conversation again in a decade, but our economic systems are the ones that are determining a lot of these decisions right now. We also have some politicians uh, or some national or some country leaders who, who are doing absolutely abysmal things. It is true. They are operating in a manner that is the opposite of the seven virtues and are, are expressing the seven deadly sins. I mean, in our face right now, collectively, we are looking at some pretty hellish prospects. We need to find the moral courage to stand up to these kinds of values that frankly have to be prophetic. Um, being willing to have the kind of courage that Martin Luther King and John Lewis and all of their supporters had during the Civil Rights Movement to put their bodies on the line, but fundamentally grounded in love. One of the things I learned or tried to do, well, I did uh, about a couple years ago when I sometimes do the rosary, I don't do it very often, but I'll, when I do a Hail Mary, I'll, I'll actually devote a Hail Mary to a particular person. And I have done Hail Marys for Vladimir Putin, um, mm. Donald Trump, um, some really difficult people right now. And that was an incredibly difficult thing to say, to pray that please may they have a conversion of heart. Because if they did have a conversion of heart, oh my gosh, would our world be so transformed? So trying to ground even the most difficult people in a sense of love is what God calls us to do. And to me, that's one of the starts of having the moral courage to carry on in these very difficult circumstances. Thank you. Sister Carol. Amen. Yes. Yeah. And that is not easy to do. Mm. I don't know if you could hear him. I could hear him and feel yeah. him as he was sitting next to me yeah. saying that. With intention, it is very hard to do. With intention, it's very hard to listen to someone else's story. With intention, it's very hard to kind of look in the mirror. And when you ask the question, Kathleen, about you know ecology and democracy, I'm actually not surprised that both are in the shape that they're in. Because we, from most faith traditions, humans are you know, in the creation stories of faith traditions across all the religious, all the, uh, the faith traditions, humans are given some responsibility. Not domination but some responsibility for everything that lives, including each other. We are not doing a very good job at that, at the ecological level. We are not taking care of the sharks and the birds and the trees. So it's not a surprise to me that I'm not taking care of anybody that's not like me, doesn't look like me, think like me, talk like me, smell like me, eat like me. It's just kind of an echo chamber. And I'm also not surprised that democracy here and in other places around the world, but we're here now. I'm not surprised that the democracy is in the shape that it's in because the democracy is me. When I look in the mirror, this form of government depends on the citizens 
to elect the leaders to represent us. So both the ecological challenge and the political challenges and the economic systems, they all function because people are supporting it in some way. I look at the sports and the entertainment world and the salaries that are paid. Who sustains those football games? All those people in the stands. Who sustains the violent movies? All the people who buy the tickets or buy the, the video game. So the mirror every morning for me is the hardest place to be. When I think about the condition of the ecology, when I think about the condition of the democracy. And I don't say that to like, oh, geez, how do I even get out of bed? You know, I do actually, you know. And um, I, I do because I was 13 years at the United Nations. And I'm telling you, it was just an incredible, powerful experience to see such diversity really have at their heart and their goal, the betterment of the world. Their challenge was they had to convince their governments back home mm. to make laws that would mirror the dreams and the visions and the aspirations of the Millennium Development Goals or the Sustainable Development Goals. What I learned there was that if I want to change the world, I need to change the world where my feet are. Mm. That's how the world changes, where my feet are. The democracy will change where my feet are, when I'm not afraid to go on the other side of the river, when I actually get in the car and go there, or when I call you and say, can we have lunch? and I'll come to you. It all sounds so simple, but it is not easy. Because if it was easy, we wouldn't be in the ecological or the democratic situation that we're in, it seems to me. Thank you. Thank Linda, you. Can you uh, what practices help sustain you in this? So for me, it's to shower the disfavored with favor and kindness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm to shower the disfavored with favor and kindness. And what do I mean by that? I mean to see me as a human being, not as a black woman. What do I mean by that? To look at my community east of the river and we're the last community to be developed and and we're being pushed out of our neighborhood because of economics, the economics of the city. What do I mean by that? DC is no longer Chocolate City. Mm -hmm. It's, um, oh, I forgot, what's the, oh God, I'm losing my words. Uh, God, please give it to me. Well, it's no longer Chocolate City. It's not Vanilla City. It's whatever that is in the middle. Mocha. Mocha. <laughs> Thank you, Jose. We're Mocha City now. And I just, I think it's so important for you guys to know that because we have been through so much trauma, so much crime, so much violence, we don't get to appreciate having a beautiful community like this to live in because we get pushed out. We can't afford to live in the community that we suffered through poverty and lack of education and unemployment. And then all of a sudden there are more trees and more beautiful homes and more retail and movies. And I can't enjoy that right now. And I'm afraid of that, to be perfectly honest, because when that starts, and it's already happening in our community, so that's my fear. I would love to be, have our community showered with favor so we can stay where we are. Let the progress come, but we can afford to stay where we are. But that means that people have to be paying attention. People have to, it's not always about money. It's not, it's about, recognizing that we are people too. We deserve a nice place to live. We deserve a beautiful community with clean air. And, um, um, and I must say, I'm so grateful to be on this panel with all of you. I didn't know you were a doctor, by the way. I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm so grateful to be a part of this conversation because I think it happened, I know in my spirit that it needs to happen more often. And I hope that if churches are watching this, 
that churches find a way to take the responsibility to not only shower their members with favor, but to shower the community outside of the church with favor as well. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you all for this wonderful conversation. I want to open it up to the audience now um, to see what questions you have for our, our panelists. And if you can just uh, stand up and speak loudly uh, so we can hear you. Um, oh, we do have microphones, so you can just raise your hand. Um, what questions do you have for our panelists about anything that came up or something you've been wondering about in relationship um, with ecology and or democracy? <laughs> this happens in my classes all the time. Yep. <laughs> then I just ask the question in a different way yep. and then it shakes something loose. <laughs> Daniel Burke. Hello. Hi, Dan. So, here comes the microphone. <laughs> Daniel Burke, I work at the Center on Faith and Justice with Kathleen. Thank you all for coming tonight. This has been really interesting and helpful. Um, I'm wondering if you can all talk about some of the chief obstacles that you face in your work. In some ways, you've already spoken about this, economics, the complexities of the system ourselves, uh, racism. But I'm wondering if, if each of you could just pick out one obstacle that you find in your work, and that could be apathy, it could be anything, uh, and then maybe suggest a way to deal with that obstacle um, that might be helpful as well. Yeah, thank you. I, I can start, um, because I think about this a lot, and that's kind of my day job, is that question, exactly, um, how we deal with the obstacles and, and overcome them. Um, I think for me, there's lots of ways you could get about it, but it's often making explicit the connection between the local, right, the individual actions we take, the ways that we live most of the footprint of our lives situated in place, and scaling those into structural and systemic change. And that's not an easy connection point to make all the time. Um, and what we wind up with is often a kind of bifurcation of, I can make changes if I have the wherewithal and the means and the capacity and the resources to do it, but is that actually inuring to a paradigm shift? Are we changing things at the structural scale? And the reason that's important is because if it's only a matter of communities mounting a resistance to deal with some acute you know, ecological or social crisis, it's constant reaction and constant catch up. We never actually get to the point where the system isn't producing those same outcomes, poor social and economic outcomes, and poor environmental and ecological outcomes. Here's an example. Um, we work with students in Anacostia from time to time. Um, and the last time we spoke with them a few weeks ago, and they'll be here actually next week to visit, and we go back and forth. And it takes a lot to do that. The one of the anecdotes that they shared was that in their school, there was only one working water fountain. And the filter hadn't been changed in years. And they were self-advocating for the filter to be changed. And that's important right, to do the acute moment of changing the filter so that at least they can have a clean water source there. But there aren't enough filters in the world to only go all in on filters. At some point we need to interrogate, why is the water coming through dirty in the first place? We need to connect the changing the filters and the students advocating for clean water at their point of, of source, but also systemically how the water has gotten fouled in the first place and why it's even thinkable that that can be pumped into a school like that. So connecting the individual and the local with the systemic and the structural feels to me like an obstacle, but when we're conscious about it, we can bend those two pieces together. It just takes a lot of work to do it. I think for me the challenge is health. We are looking at the intersection of climate change and health. And when you look at health disparities in the District of Columbia, those of us that live east of the river, health disparities are alarmingly high. We have the highest rate of breast cancer in Ward 8 in the DMV, hmm. DC, Maryland, and Virginia. And we have asthma and diabetes and all this stuff that's intersected with, with um, climate change, and my goodness, the pandemic just exacerbated it. Um, and one of the things that I discovered during the 
pandemic, for example, is that we adopted the sedentary lifestyle and it exacerbated our health disparities. And so now I am such, I am so promoting forest bathing like I have never done before. Getting out there and connecting to Mother Earth and walking on our trails. But I guess the big thing also is making people feel safe. How do you make our community feel safe? And it's something that we're still trying to figure out because at the end of the day, we die sooner. We spend more times in hospitals because um, we don't go, we don't take a proactive approach to health. We go to the emergency room. So we're trying to figure out how to explore that intersection between health and climate change. It's a really, really big deal. And it, it affects our mental health too. So the trauma and the physical health is something that we need to pay more attention to. So we'll be around for a long, long time. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I think um, not to be too simplistic, but I, when I heard your question, the two words came to me it was the biggest challenge for me and for I think many people I know is to wake up, mm -hmm. literally wake up. You know, when you were talking earlier, Brenda, I was thinking of Hurricane Katrina and the difference between that and Superstorm Sandy in Manhattan. There's no way that Manhattan would have ever had the same pictures that we saw on television from Hurricane Katrina because the color of the people in the New Orleans Stadium and the economic level of the people in the New Orleans Stadium and on roofs that were asking to be saved was not the same color as the people in Manhattan when Superstorm Sandy came through. So wake up, wake up. This is not rocket science. The resolutions, the answers, if you will, or the solutions, it's not rocket science. If I had the will, and if we had the will, it, meaning the healing of the planet and the wholeness of the democracy, would happen. So I think it does come back to me and to us. And as long as I stay in my echo chamber, you know, for example, we're in an institution of higher education. I have a terminal degree. Isn't that a lovely name for a PhD? <laughs> a terminal degree, okay? You've seen the study about 100 people on the planet, but all of the socioeconomic stratifications are proportionate to what they are in the real world. Out of those 100 people on the planet, uh, 70, 80 out of those 100 people can't read. And 70 of them are women. I know no one who is unable to read. Everybody in my family has a college degree. Most sisters in my community have a master's degree. So wake up. Mm. Wake up, like what to do about that? Get engaged in a, 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 a literacy program at the local library. I mean, do something with your feet to make, I know it's going to sound corny, to make the world a better place. You know, if I did that and you did it and you did it and everybody I know did it, we would begin to see the impact of that. Because one of the things we know about the, the natural world is morphogenic fields are really real. There have been studies done where people pray in one part of the world that the prison violence in another part of the world will decrease. Mm -hmm. And there's an absolute inverse relationship. The more prayer, the less violence. So it is possible to make this world a better place by actually doing good. I know that sounds really, it sounds so simple, but I, I just keep saying if it was so simple, we wouldn't be having this conversation if it was so simple. So wake up. Is, is the challenge that I face. And a lot of people like me, I think, we choose, we prefer to be asleep. We watch Gaza on the television, and then there's a commercial for Burger King. I mean, the human mind cannot, you need to step back and really ponder that, you know? It, would just, it, it just keeps, there's no reflection, there's no capacity to do reflexive thinking, which is where the contemplation comes in to be still and quiet and centered and go to your kind of your inner life. 
and I'm not saying everybody has to be holy. This is not about being holy. It's about being a whole. Mm -hmm. And if we were whole, we wouldn't be having this conversation either. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to take a different tack. Um, Daniel, thanks for the question. Um, so 77% uh, 7 of the global economy is energy. Um, someone recently told me it's the first 7%. Mm -hmm. We all depend on it, just inherently. We are unfortunately addicted to oil still. And we're seeing, for example, oil companies and petrostates um, making record profits mm -hmm. still, right? Um, United States is the number one fossil fuel producer in the world. Guess who number seven is? Norway. Hmm. So um, we need changes of heart at the very top. Um, this is not climate stuff. This is not Catholic climate stuff. Uh, this is um, just my musings about these things. Um, so we need a change of heart. Back in 2018 and 2019, Pope Francis asked uh, oil executives to come to the Vatican. And they were initially like, oh great, we get to see the Pope, get a picture and all this. And he, he laid down the moral foundation mm -hmm. for them. What responsibility do you have to your children when you know what you know? So they know, they know. How guilty they feel about it is another, is another thing. But this is for some of the folks here. We have seen the children of some of these executives weigh in, or the children of some of these politicians weigh in, and that's what gets them to move. So one of the like, you know, nuanced strategies is, you know, if you have, and we know that you know these younger generations, one of your top two priorities is climate change. There was a Cairo report that just came out, Georgetown um, Catholic ARA, mm -hmm. um, that said that you know Catholic children. Climate change is one of their top two priorities. If you are messaging to your peers and you are messaging to these, these children are messaging to their parents who are in industries who are making decisions that are bad for the environment, well, they need to be talking more with them because that is where a change of heart happens. And it's also our responsibility, if we're people of faith, to follow Pope Francis's lead and also ask, fundamentally, these are moral questions because they will come up with any kind of political, economic, whatever kind of intellectual argument to justify whatever it is that they're doing. One of the challenges that we have in a society that is separated from nature is that we have lost our understanding of our inmost being and our understanding of our inmost being as integral and inseparable from our natural world. So if we actually take that strength and that awareness and you are with peers who have parents who are in these industries or you're coming to have a conversation with someone who is opposed to you, you take these moral messages and seek metanoia. You seek change of heart. These are iterative conversations that are grounded in respect and are very difficult, but you have to have them because that's what we're left with. We are left fundamentally with a moral call. Do you care for our common home? Do you care for our future? This is really where we are right now, change of heart. Thank you. We have time for some more questions. Did you have time to think of one? <laughs> okay. Yes, Shelby. There's a microphone I'm coming. Right <laughs> it's right here. So how do you, there was a lot of talk about building relationships and listening to people. So how do you do both that and ask the moral <laughs> question? Like, what if the answer is no? When you ask people, do you care? And like, when actions speak louder than words and people like seem to say no, what's the next step? Thank Everyone you. cares about something. Mm -hmm. And if they don't care about the same thing in the same way as I do, then I can keep talking with them to find out what they do care about. And eventually I think we will get to something in common, right? Because as was said, 
we do breathe the same air. We drink the same water. Maybe not in the same place, right? Because there are differences in the air and the water from place to place. But at scale, the planet isn't inventing new air and new water. It keeps recirculating around and around and around and around. And as was said, generationally, it shows up. It registers in us, in our bodies. That trauma shows up epigenetically, right? Like it transmits across generations. And also the soil holds the memory of all that. So eventually, if we keep talking, we do get to a point of common frame of reference. But it doesn't mean that we will agree or you know, always walk out feeling like, wow, that was great to spend time learning about your divergent. You know, like sometimes those things can really challenge our perspectives. But again, as was said, like if someone doesn't care about a healthy environment or a healthy democracy, then it's our job to care for them because they're also trapped by the system that they may feel as if they're benefiting from they don't necessarily always realize that it's working against them in many ways and working against certainly the durability and sustainability of those systems, which everyone has an investment in, right? Like, you know, like taking what we need now, but leaving as much behind and, and an equal opportunity for who comes after us. We didn't appear out of a vacuum and there will be folks here after us and, and being present for that flow is really important. So, you know, find a common point of care but if you can't specifically, then wrap your sense of empathy and care around the issues that you care about and realize that you're also doing it even for folks who may not be on the same page at the same moment in time. Yeah, I, I would support that. I think it's going to take a lot of conversation. It's not going to happen in one conversation. I would say keep talking. Just keep talking. And to go back to the contemplative work and the deep listening, you know, when we listen, if you're sitting here right now listening to me, because I'm speaking right now, and you're thinking I'm how much longer this is going to go, I have to use the restroom, or I see that fruit out there and the cookies on the tape, then you're not listening. It is very challenging to listen. You know? So to listen without a tape going in your head to get ready for me to respond to you, that's not listening. I think and we need a lot of practice in having those conversations. We do not know how to have a conversation with each other without me being ready to rebut you or ready to defend me and convince you. That, that's the heart of the polarization. And that's what we need to heal. And the change theorists say the healing for polarization are two characteristics. Humility, which we've talked about already, and curiosity. Because somebody on either end of whatever it is, white, black, good, bad, right, wrong, earth, humans, money, put whatever the odds are, the relationships now are so steeped in those polarized ends that nobody's going anywhere except just deeper in their own mindset. The antidote to that, the change theorists say, is one, one side has to become a little humble and a little curious and begin walking towards the other side. And the best question to ask is, I never thought about it that way. Would you say some more, please? You know, we have to learn how to actually have conversations with each other. Keep talking. Thank you. I agree that you keep talking, but when I get no's, I don't have the luxury of continuing the conversation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because of my woundedness. Yeah. And I just have to just keep going yeah. and don't have that luxury. Yeah. Jose, what have you got to say? Um, there will be some people who disagree. I mean, that is just the way it is in human history. I recall a, uh, a lobby meeting that um, some bishops had with regard to immigration with regard and talking to a, a senator. And obviously, the bishop was very eloquent. And the senator just said, I don't agree with you. Um, take that to a, an even more starker place, um, you know, what happened down in the South with, with regard to civil rights. I mean, I'm going back to what is prophetic. There are you know, some people who simply oppose the values that we're talking about. Um, and, you know, as Martin Luther King says, you know, power does not give up voluntarily. Um, we are going to have to, if necessary, be prophetic and, and sacrifice ourselves as the people, um, the water protectors at the Dakota Access Pipeline. We may just see more of that. And do we have the moral courage to step into that? I'm not saying I have it right now, but 
that's what I'm striving for because I'm in, you know, we, we are in challenging times where one of the polarizing sides will just take it to the limit regardless of what the systems are built to be right now. Do we have the moral courage to step into this conflict with love? I think that's a great, uh, a great question to, to end on and to go forth uh, with, to kind of uh, send us off. So thank you all so much for offering such wonderful and meaningful uh, insights and thought-provoking. Uh, let's give our panelists a round of applause.